a, a room full of uh, willing people to, to consider this subject of death and dying. Um, before we begin, and uh, I, I, I would like to bring death into the room, actually, because it, it was a, quite a tender moment for some of us because we heard yesterday that one of our doulas died on Monday, and uh, it, uh, we weren't completely aware of her whole journey, but um, there's something very powerful about, here it is, very present with us, and her name is uh, Jackie Harris. Some of you will know her, some of you may not. Um, but it feels very important somehow to bring her into the room because she was an extraordinary woman and, uh, um, yeah, very tender. So I I'd like to just honour her um, as we start our day. Um, so, yes, death is not an accident. It's rather an odd title, really. Um, but uh, we live in, in, our, in our world and in our culture as if death is something um, that shouldn't be happening so often. Um, as if it's um, uh, a mistake of some kind. Um, and actually, it's probably one of the fundamental reasons why I started Living Well, Dying Well. And I'd just like to give you a little bit of context um, uh, as we start the day. Just I have a very short talk, but I'd, li I'd just like to bring this as we start. Um, and about 10 years ago, as, as Anna said, um, after working in, in this field for a very long time as a, as a nurse and a midwife and uh, as a trainer and um, person doing personal development work with others, I, I began to feel very uncomfortable about the way death and dying was, was going. Um, and for those of you who aren't necessarily in a, a pr working in a professional context, um, it, it's, uh, it seems to me that there's often uh, quite a lot of intervention around the dying time um, and, and quite a lot of over-treatment very often. And, and it, it, we're in a very difficult um, set of circumstances, ethical dilemmas, and I suspect Mark might talk a little bit more about that in his talk this afternoon. Um, but the question I had was, how can we make death easier, you know, s simpler, kinder, but also recognizing that it isn't solely dependent upon medical professionals. And certainly among the public, I think um, people see death as a medical event nowadays. Um, I see it as a human event, and I see medicine as a fantastic resource, uh, but it isn't the whole story. And so the question that I was starting with, how can we bring it back to our own hands uh, in some way as citizens. Um, and uh, also recognizing that death is a tremendous mystery. We don't know the answers. Um, they're, they're, we need expertise, for sure, but I don't believe there are any experts in death. Every death is different, um, and we can bring our expertise each time freshly um, but it's not something that can be prescriptive, really. So um, I'm very interested in how we can come back to simplicity um, um, and perhaps avoid some of the complexity that exists around death and dying um, in, our, in our society at the moment. And one of the questions I also asked myself um, was what does it mean to be facilitative rather than prescriptive? Um, and to come back right down to the person who's dying and those who are surrounding them. It's very unusual for people to live in a to totally isolated life. We all have a social network of some kind, whether that's a family um, network or um, a friendship network, professional network. Um, we, we will have some people around us. Um, and how can we put those people back um, at the center of this experience? And so often, um, it, it seems to me that when people do seek medical help, they can often get very caught up in um, a big machine. And it's very easy to forget that this person has a life and a world that is central to them. Um, and um, we can forget 
that whole life that, that is behind that individual. So um, I, I look at it for myself, and I urge you to look at it for yourselves. And in fact, throughout the whole of today, I would like you to think about what we're talking about in terms of your own life and your own death, because it's too easy to, to, to uh, put it out there. If we can continually bring it back to ourselves, what might this mean to us? Um, I think we're beginning to uh, change how we operate in society. Um, and so if we are beginning to put people at the center, for me, my world, if you like, is, is um, uh, my, my husband and my family. I'm very lucky to have a, a, a very happy, lovely life. My home is key to me. Um, my friendship circle is, um, sustains me. Um, my fantastic um, doula network, of fantastic people who've joined me on this journey um, of, of the doula training and, and doula practice. Um, my spiritual path, which is key to me, my local community. So, you know, this is my world. And as I get older, or if I get frail and ill, I want my world to be respected. I, I would like anybody who's around me, supporting me, to really hold that um, life tenderly and kindly. Um, so it's a very um, interesting um, way of, of sh perhaps shifting things to, to put the person and the individual at, their at the center of things. Um, some of the people here will laugh when I talk about the pebble of, in the pond model of change because I believe this is how change happens. It's very interesting that we often look to government or we look to authorities to make change happen. I think change happens with us as an individual. And I think when people start our doula training, they're already um, talking to the taxi driver about the course. They might be talking to their friends and family. They might be talking to their friendship circle about death and dying. They're raising the subject <coughs> in a very natural and, and normal way. Um, and I think if we are to begin to change the uh, perspectives in society, um, to normalize death, to perhaps start to take the fear out of it, to be able to inform each other um, that um, death is, is natural and it's gonna happen to all of us, we have to start talking much, much more than we do as a society now. Um, so I love the image of the pebble in the pond. Um, we're, po we're throwing a great big pebble in, but every single person in this room can throw their own pebble in. It will ripple out. Um, uh, I, I believe this is how change happens. And I do have permission to use these photographs, by the way. Um, so, and I, I, I constantly draw the parallels between birth and death. Um, and, you know, women have been giving birth for eons. Um, it isn't always perfect. It isn't always easy. But somehow, women's bodies know how to give birth. And I believe it's the same for death. Um, I think we are programmed to know what to do. Or that, that clearly, we are. But I'm terribly, as a former midwife, um, concerned about the over medicalization of birth um, and how by not trusting and creating the conditions in which women can give birth safely, uh, feeling safe, um, then we're starting a process of interference, if you like. And, and we're seeing this happening more and more around the dying time. And I would love us to be able to think of death as something that we deeply know about in terms of our own death, but that as human beings, we deeply know um, about the dying time. But we're kind of more and more losing our confidence with it 
because we have handed it over very often to professionals. Um, so I, I, I'm not saying we don't need professionals, but I believe that we lose our own res inner resources, we lose our confidence if we don't become um, uh, resourced within ourselves and within our communities to be able to, to be with death and dying. Am I making sense? Um, so the key feature, I think, um, of being with death and dying is, is to relearn the art of accompaniment. And um, this is really learning to, be, to journey without a map. If we're walking alongside someone who's dying, we've no idea how it's going to go. Um, and we have to find a way to trust the process um, and not be too frightened and to, to know that there, there are lots of resources around that we can draw on to make it as easy as possible. But there may be periods of tremendous suffering. There may be periods of difficulty. And this is how it goes. It, it isn't necessarily wrong that, these, that this journey um, can be difficult. It can also be sublimely simple and beautiful. And I would like us to uh, spread the word about that, actually. So uh, accompaniment, we don't know the, the, the time of arrival. We, we, we don't know a lot about the destination. Um, but actually witnessing, being present with, um, in this role of amicus mortis, a friend in death, um, is really where we sit as end-of-life doulas. Um, and I think it's a, a crucial role that um, we knew about a hundred years ago. This is, this is how we um, manage death and dying in our communities. And uh, certainly, I think, if we're looking at sustainability in the long term, as a society, we're on a very dodgy, dodgy ground at the moment with the demographic on aging. Um, we have to make death all of our business. We can't keep handing it over. Um, it's really important that we recognize we have a responsibility here. Um, and death literacy, I believe, um, is a life skill we should be fostering between ourselves. Um, it's how can we engage with others? How can we inform each other so that we're empowered to make choices that um, certainly when it comes to our own death mean we have some sense of control? And clearly we have um, no ultimate control. But to, to be able to be informed enough to say, well, actually, I'd like this and I'd like that and I'd like to be able to die in, in the hospice or I'd like to be able to die at home. Um, if we talk about it, we can create something like a death plan, if you like. Um, and I think death doulas, end-of-life doulas, are, are really a, an important part of this um, story going forwards because quite a lot of our training um, and our practice is about helping people make choices, uh, creating an, an advanced plan, uh, advanced decisions and that kind of thing. Um, and again, recognizing that the medical model is an important resource among many, um, and also knowing that in our communities, this tremendous resource, we're great fans of something called um, the Compassionate Communities Model. And a, a pioneer, um, a man called um, Alan Keller here, some of you will know about, um, a professor, a, a sociology professor of palliative care, has really pioneered this movement of uh, recognizing that there's phenomenal resource in our communities. How can we draw on that resource? How can we use the people who are around this person to um, facilitate them um, at, the, at the time of death. Um, so I think often we find when we work with uh, people that, ooh, that was good, um, it's working, <laughs> that um, there are friends and family who 
long to be able to contribute? How, do I, how can I help? People want to help. So part of our role is perhaps to um, facilitate that um, so that the family life can continue as normal, as far as possible, and that life can be lived right, right to the end. So doulas are filling a gap. That it's a totally non-medical role, um, a, a role of informed companionship. And we're focusing on support in its broadest sense practical, emotional, social, spiritual, if, if that's uh, an important factor in, in those people's lives. It's not just about the person that's dying, it's about their whole family or the friendship group, those people that care for them uh, that we become involved with. So that's a bit of an overview uh, about why we're here today um, and, and the work of um, end-of-life doulas that is a a real growing movement, and um, I think it's, um, it's of its time. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>